does the working class have no place in the world of writing? Is nepotism the key to a job in publishing? Hello creatives, welcome to Crash Culture where we debate the findings of the Panic Report and the consequential book Culture is Bad for You and how these translate to real life people and situations. So I'm Aya and I'm Sunny and today we'll be discussing the relationship of the working class and the successes in the writing industry. I don't know about you, but I've had years of struggle trying to break into publishing. As someone who is a first generation immigrant and working class, I have been at a disadvantage with my reading from a young age and have wanted to provide an example to my younger self that it is possible. Well, I have applied to a few highly competitive roles and I've been called into a few interviews actually. I think I've been called into three mm -hmm. in all my 20 years. Um, <laughs> that's really lucky in itself. In the waiting area of these interviews is when I really began to feel the difference between me and the middle class competition. They are comfortable in the atmosphere with their knowledge and their experience. They just know how to speak and this small difference like I feel like can lead and probably has led to myself and others not getting their starting role in the writing industry. I do remember an interview from mine from a couple of years ago where I just professionally, and I was on time, like I was feeling confident, you know, not yeah. really that confident. It's this, this one-off yes. where you're like, oh, I've got this. You're convincing that, yourself. You know, that false confidence that you're trying to put into yourself. But then another person comes in just professionally, but they're not on time, right? She was late and I, I was really annoyed. It's like, Please, it's like a really important At time. least for us. Uh, for us, exactly. Least, but it was obviously not to her. Yeah. Guess who got the interview and who went home? It's just really <laughs> not fair. Yeah. Even with my parents, it was clear which one of us was from the working class and which one was from a more formal. It's the hand me down middle. blazers that yeah. get them. Yeah. Oh my god, yes. Like they can tell which one is a hand me down blazer and which yeah. isn't. Yeah, like, they're like, oh, this is from the spring summer collection Don't 20, 2020. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you analyzing my outfit and not yeah. my mind or what I'm saying Exactly, to you? and it's just, you're just so intimidated by them, I feel. So basically, we're going to further explore this topic and we've brought in someone who has ended up successful within their <laughs> career. She has been breaking expectations, mm -hmm. overcoming stereotypes um, of the typical writer's image and background, and we are joined by Kit DeWall, who is a British-Irish writer, known activist, Birdport Flash Fiction Prize winner. She's a winner. She is. <laughs> she is. And My Name is Leon. Her first novel was published in 2016 and it was actually shortlisted for the Costa Book Award. Um, and recently she's been working um, helping promote an anthology, The 32, which highlights Irish working class voices. Which is a fee in itself. She's giving voice to the voiceless, as a matter of fact, or rather helping them, supporting them to, you know, promote themselves, get themselves out there, get a standing in their career. And, well, as Sunny always says, it is a nice day to interview somebody. Exactly. <laughs> well, hi, Kit. Welcome to Crash Culture, and thank you so much for joining us today. Today we wanted to talk with you about the relationship the writing industry has with the working class. And before we begin, we wanted to ask you a silly question to get to know a bit better. What is your favourite pudding and why? Very difficult. Sticky toffee pudding um, with salty caramel ice cream, to be fair. It would be an old style English pudding, heavy, wintry with custard or cream. What about yeah. you, Sunny? I have to be cheeky and say cheesecake. Oh, there's nothing. There's so many variations of it. I don't think you can get really tired. There's chocolate cheesecake, caramel cheesecake, fruit cheesecake, key lime pie. And what about you, Aya? What about me? What's your favorite <laughs> pudding? Custard, is that pudding? Yeah, uh, custard and chocolate yeah. cake. That's what they always say. I would say it's, 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 I'd say it's an addition to a pudding as opposed mm -hmm. to a pudding itself. However, my son does eat bowls of custard with a dollop of jam <laughs> in the middle, so yeah. So I think we should dive in. So we wanted to bring up your Q&A with writers online where um, they stated you've become, perhaps without meaning to, a spokesperson for the working class voice in literature and in art. Um, your recent project, The 32 Anthology, clearly highlights this. Could you tell us a little bit more about this upcoming project? First of all, The 32 is something I supported and got off the ground, but I certainly didn't do any of the heavy lifting on that. And all the hard work was done by somebody called Paul McVeigh, who's a writer from Northern Ireland. And he's edited that book, got it together, raised all the money, 
you know, he's done a fantastic job. But it is the Irish version of Common People. Common People and the 32 is an anthology of working class writers. So it includes really well-known people. For example, the 32 includes people like Roddy Doyle, Lisa McInerney, other big names, really well-known authors, alongside people that have never been published before. And this is their opportunity to showcase their story and to showcase their writing. And it is just the cousin, I'd say. It's the Irish cousin of Common People. Common People did exactly the same thing. What I intended with Common People is two things. First of all, to demonstrate that some of the great writers out there are working class. So it provides a model, if you like, or some kind of modeling for working class people to say, oh, look, they did it. They came from my background and they did it. Maybe I can do it. It's like having a working class hero who's made it. In fact, they're proud to say, this is who I am. This is where I come from. The other side of the anthology is a leg up to those new writers coming behind who need some of those industry contacts that we don't have, who needs a little bit of help to get through that gate into publishing from complete obscurity. Being included in an anthology with some famous writers is, is great for them. It's, it's something they can take to a publisher or to an agent and say, look, I'm already in this anthology. T someone's taken a chance on me. Will you look at my manuscript? And the most important thing that I wanted to do and accomplish with Common People is for it to be a celebration of who we are. As soon as people start talking about working class writing, they think it's going to be, you took heroin. Oh, you didn't have enough to eat. Oh, you had no shoes. Oh, it was so hard. Oh, your dad beat him on. People have got misconceptions about what it is to be working class. Completely missing out the celebratory aspect of who we are. The laugh, the solidarity, the strength of character the ingenuity that we have to have the resilience that we have to have and I don't I will you know talk later about resilience and why it's not necessarily a good thing but we do have resilience we do care about one another every, every, there are so many things so many great things about working class and as soon as you talk about working class stories people think it's going to be doom and gloom so I wanted to make sure that a lot of these stories were people laughing and celebrating talking about of course it was hard yes it was hard but also look what we had Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, it's That's beautiful. Okay. I really like that you're focusing on shedding light on the positives because being working class is nothing to be really ashamed of, I think. It's something to celebrate. It's, it's just a circumstance. It's a situation. Mm, absolutely. So one question was, how do you feel giving a leg up for these types of people in helping them celebrate their lives and their stories? It's, for me, one of the most important things that I can do as a writer. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone should do it. I wouldn't put that on anyone. If, if you've made it through the door and you're a well-known writer, should you help people coming behind, morally speaking? I don't know. Sometimes you haven't got it. You haven't got it in you. You haven't got the time. You haven't got the inclination, whatever. For me, absolutely, I think I should. So I'm only going to talk about me. Um, sometimes a lot of people have got things going on that we don't know about it. Making it through the door does not make you rich. Making it through the door doesn't automatically make you well known. Making it through the door doesn't get rid of the rest of the problems in your life. So I, I, I would never say you should do it. I would say do it if you can. Do it if you're moved to. Do it if you do have a bit of spare cash. If you do have access to people that can help other people. So for me, it was probably the first thing I thought about doing when I got published. How can I help other people coming behind me to not have, you can't solve the problems in the publishing industry, but you can look after your own little patch of grass. You can say, okay, this is all I can do. It's a tiny little patch of grass, but I can look after it. I can make things grow there. I can just do my little thing. And so for me, that's what I wanted to do when I got published. Be there as a role model, if that doesn't sound too arrogant, but also just to go, what do you need? Can I do it? And one of the most important things for me was demystifying what it was. I didn't know you had to have an agent to get published. I had no idea you needed an agent. So when I got one, so as soon as I was going to talk to uh, MA students or, or doing events, I'd say, you need an agent. Probably you need an agent. I didn't know there was a difference between independent publishers and mainstream publishers. I didn't know what an editor was. I didn't know this and I didn't know that. So I started talking about it just so that people could say, oh, thanks for telling me that piece of information that costs you zero to tell. And as a minimum, I think 
a lot of us could do that. Yeah, I feel like we could all turn giving advice to all of these other people, um, a point of activism. My question is, what was the starting point of this activism? What was the point where you realized you need to kickstart your passion and you need to voice your opinions on your platforms? I remember going to do a lit- literary event maybe a year after I got published and uh, you know as I was you know people calling me onto the stage and they said and we'd like to introduce Kit Tavar writer and activist and I was like I'm not an activist what do you mean activist I had never ever considered myself an activist it still doesn't feel like it's me I don't I don't set out to be an activist at all I don't set out to be a spokesperson I don't set out to be anyone's hero and I think there are some people who are doing so much and who dedicate their life to this stuff Uh, you know people like Greta Thurberg if that's the way you say a name that's an activist you know that's someone who's putting themselves out there day after day and getting shit for it and I'd say that's an activist strictly speaking I am I I just don't feel like it I feel like I'm doing what I should be doing and it's not enough either I would like to do a lot more was there a moment that I no there was never a moment I I think the, the moment that it was thrust on me was when I gave an interview to The Guardian to Dawn Foster and she asked me something about publishing and I just went where are all the working class writers but this was in you know this was in the context of a two-hour interview but I know I said it because I I was genuinely asking where are they I I wasn't saying something like um, hang on where are all the working class writers I was going oh like where are the toilets you know I thought they were out there it, it was a genuine question and she made that the headline of my interview I'd spoken about loads of things about publishing and writing and being a writer but that was the headline of my interview and that's when I think people started seeing me as an activist this genuine question because I literally thought they were there uh, had turned into sort of a, a call call out so I think that's when it sort of became associated with my name since then I've had a lot of opportunities to talk about what I believe and I think those opportunities have turned into me being seen as an activist there is one thing I will never do and that is not talk about truth and not talk about the things I think are wrong how hard it is for some people and not talk about where I come from and never ever ever deny who I am and where I come from I that's impossible for me to do yeah I feel like it's because you're so genuine about it and it comes to you so naturally yeah and I feel like it's such a great thing to do because it is really such a a closed door industry it is really hard to find information as you were saying so hard to know corporate publishing independent publishing and so on speaking about Greta Thunberg do you feel as if young people have a responsibility to raise their own voices and like she's doing, um, spreading awareness on these issues. I think if you have a platform, try and do it. But, you know, it's so hard. You know, if, if someone's out there and by the skin of their teeth or by their own devices or through luck or however it is, if they've got somewhere, yes, try and do it. But if you can't do it, don't do it. Because, you know, thrusting that responsibility on young people who are battling so much shit, I would say, if you can, great, if you can take it on. What you shouldn't do is take on the worries of the world and take on so much when you're trying to do so much in some of the most difficult circumstances this world has ever seen and will ever see don't put it on yourself if you can speak about it if you've got the capacity to speak about it and do something about it and raise your voice then do it do not make your mental health suffer or your life suffer or your time suffer or your physical health suffer because someone's saying you should do this as well sometimes getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth is what you can accomplish today and next week And if that's all you can do, that's all you can do. Don't try and be everything to everyone. And if you see the person next to you, oh, they can do that. They're going on that march. They're writing that essay. They're doing signing that petition. They're speaking up and they're doing That's great for them. That's great if they can do it. Don't compare yourself with anyone else. Most importantly, do not compare the inside of your life with the outside of someone else's life. You look at someone and you think, wow, they look great. You don't know what's going on for them, really. You see those celebrities who look like they've got the world. Then you find out they've 
committed suicide through depression the outside of their life looks great and you're comparing it to the inside of your life don't do that you get through the day how you get through the day be kind to yourself be kind to other people if you've got extra capacity if you've got a bit of extra money if you've got a bit of extra headspace if you've got a bit of extra time of course help people if you can but you know what look after yourself first and be strong first so that you're doing all that of that from a position of strength and personal safety and good mental health the shit in this world is not the responsibility of young people who who's fucked up the world nobody under 18 nobody under 25 it's my generation that fucked up the world and if that question about responsibility to change things should come to anyone it's my generation not your generation I completely agree with that. I feel like we already have so much stress and anxiety over personal things that affect a smaller circle rather than the entire globe. I feel like I completely agree with it that it's the inequalities that affect you personally that people will have more drive towards speaking out about because it's a place where you come from and that's all right. I feel like if you drive your passion into one, it doesn't make you any less an activist. And um, speaking about these inequalities, do you think that literature is used as a tool to create inequality in between classes and if so do you think that this is reflected in works written and published because there seems to be a kind of subconscious prejudice within hiring working class people there is definitely a prejudice about hiring working class people in some areas of publishing so your accent doesn't do you any favors i've got a brummy accent i've got short vowels um no one ever is going to to listen to me and think i'm middle class and, and therefore, very, very often, people are not going to listen. To, are going to listen to me and think I'm not educated and won't understand concepts or whatever. You know, this is a very narrow view of the world, except it persists. So, uh, of course, there is so much inequality in publishing. Also, the perception that you have in publishing is that here, here's let's let's take me, brummy working class perception that I'm not educated. If I write a version of Pride and Prejudice, say, is that taken seriously? Not really. If I write a version of gritty urban thriller with a couple of murders, is that taken seriously? Yes, it is. Why? Because I've got a Bromley accent and I come from Birmingham and I'm working class. So the perception is I will understand the gang fight and I'll be able to write about it. I won't understand the drawing rooms of Kent in the 18th century that's the perception it's bullshit it's absolute bullshit but that's the perception therefore when i present my novel and i've written about drawing rooms in the 18th century and then they meet me it's like oh i don't know about that however you present that to me you're probably going to get it published kit because we believe that you know that story because of where you know your accent and because you're black and all the rest of it it's bullshit absolute bullshit but that perpetuates those myths. And so you're constantly equating being working class with the urban, being working class with the thriller, being working class with understanding gangs and single parents and all the rest of it. The, the 18th century drawing room, the pride and prejudice, the gentle comedy of manners, the um, historical novel, they're not for you. They're not for me. They're going to be written by somebody else. And you can write about these. And you keep getting shunted down this road of what you are allowed to write as a working class writer. That needs to change so that we have every subject and every historical period open to us the same way it's open to anyone else. That we can write science fiction, that we can write romance, that we can write comedy, that we can write thriller, that we can write whatever we want, just the same way as middle class people can write whatever they want. And the, the publishing industry definitely needs to uh, be accepting of working class writers as well as working class writing. They are two different things. So a working class writer can write the gritty urban thriller. That's fine. But that's working class writer working about working class writing. Then there are working class writers that don't want to write about working class lives. They want to write something else. And we should have the opportunity to do that. One of the books that is centered on this podcast is called Culture is Bad for You. The researchers highlight the inequality of cultural capital between classes. And this is the unseen knowledge of arts through means such as museums, galleries, plays, and book reading. 
This may well be due to the lack of support with which parents receive, therefore having less time to give their children this cultural capital and through the lack of time or resources, therefore this puts their children at a disadvantage. How do you think that translates to the writing industry? The whole of the publishing industry, for a start, is in London. You know, with very few, let's say 95% of the publishing industry, publishing big publishing decisions is made in a very, very small area of London and a very small amount of people in London. So it meant that if you wanted an agent or if you were going to go and see your editor at Penguin, they'd say, oh, come down on Wednesday. Uh, we'd love to have a chat with you. Come down on Wednesday, really, when I live in Scunthorpe. That's like 160 quid. It's childcare. It's knowing, oh, my God, what am I going to wear? What do they wear in the office? Can I wear jeans? Can I wear that? Have I got to wear a suit? Do I take a handbag? How am I going to get from the station? to? If you've never been to London, if your parents haven't taken you to London several times, you're going to be intimidated about going to London. And by the way, I'm talking about all the writers that live beyond the M25, which is a lot of us. And so you go to London and you go from the station to the offices of Penguin, which are on the Strand, one of the most exclusive roads in London. It's about knowing how to operate. Cultural capital is about knowing how to operate. It's knowing that what to talk about, how to be yourself, how to be uh, fresh and authentic and not intimidated in those spaces. And so you've got your, yourself to London and you've maybe got a publishing deal. Maybe. These are massive, massive deals. Um, and then you have to negotiate those spaces. And it's intimidating. It can be intimidating, especially if you're young. Well, not necessarily if you're young, if you're anybody and you're not used to those spaces. One of the good things, if anything good has come out of COVID, is that a lot of those meetings are now taking place on Zoom. You, it doesn't matter whether you've got jeans on. No one can see. Um, it still means there's a lot of digital poverty. So not everyone has Zoom. Not everyone can has, has got their own computer. So many, many families have got one computer for six people um, or they're having to use Zoom on their phone and they haven't got a great contract and it's costing them a lot of money. However, it's still cheaper and it's sometimes a lot easier than going all the way to London. Also, that report, Culture is Bad for You, which is written in part by my friend David O'Brien, highlights the fact that in publishing a lot of the people that are hired to make those decisions, I'm not talking writers now, I'm talking about the decision makers, the editors and, and the staff in the publishing industry, come from a very, very narrow band of people who may have been publicly uh, private school educated, who use certain words, you phrase things in a certain way, have a certain accent. And it's about that, uh, the facility with which they negotiate those literature spaces, those literary spaces, knowing, feeling confident, feeling comfortable, knowing the conversation. Oh, I saw that exhibition last week. What exhibition? Just those things. Now, they're tiny, tiny things, but they can make you feel excluded in those spaces. If you don't know, someone says to you, I said to someone recently, oh, the so -so -so -so, it's like Graham Greene. And the person said, you know, I don't know who that is. And they were embarrassed about not knowing who Graham Greene was. Now, loads of people don't know who Graham Greene is. And you know what? If you're middle class and you're well educated, you don't give a shit about saying, I don't know who Graham Greene is. But if you're <clears throat> working class and already a little bit intimidated by your lack of education or your voice or your clothes or whatever, you think everybody knows who Graham Greene is and I don't know who Graham Greene is and I'm really embarrassed and I don't want to say. And it, you feel like you're at a, dis a disadvantage. And a lot of being in those spaces is being confident and cool with who you are. I don't know who Graham Greene is. I don't really care because I know this and I know that. And again, it comes back to the celebratory and pride aspect of no there are things we know that those people don't know. There are writers we know, there are comedians we know, there are books we've read, there are cultures, things about culture that we understand that they will never understand. Many working class people speak two languages and a couple of dialects. They've read things, they've been places, they've heard things, but we don't value that enough. So next time someone says to you, oh, I, you know, says a writer and you think, oh my God, I haven't read that writer. Should I have read that writer? Fuck that shit. I haven't read the writer, sorry. I've been doing other great things with my life. Never been embarrassed about who you are. 
I know something you don't is a mantra that's going to play in my head whenever I yeah. feel like I'm at a disadvantage. Yeah, I was lucky enough at 19 to get um, an interview. I got past the um, cover letter stage uh, for a Pinkman PR job, which is really, it was really insane to me because I've only had two weeks of unpaid work experience. And like once I went in and they were asking about my experience and all I had were the sh those short two weeks that I could explain. And it was at an independent publisher, which is, yes, they do the same thing, but it is very different in how they operate their corporate policies just admin and everything. And um, they were asking me, oh, what job I have now, what I was doing. And obviously being working class and an immigrant, I was like, I waitress. Yeah. And they, you could see the struggle on their face of, oh, how am I going to phrase this next question? Like, how is that relevant to this? It's yeah. like, you, but that was the first time in my life where I was like, yeah, I waitress. Like I wasn't really ashamed of it because someone's got to, someone's got to do it. It's, it's what lots of working class people do. And unfortunately, I didn't get the job, but it was such a such a good experience when I sat there and I was like, I've heard of this book and I've heard of this book and I love the marketing. I love the PR. I love what it's about. And they were like, oh, have you got it? And, and I had to say, no, I haven't, because I didn't have the extra 20 pounds to go and buy the hardcover yeah. that week. Yeah. And they actually ended up giving it to me for free, which is wonderful. <laughs> is but amazing. it was like, I sat there kind of ashamed of the fact that I haven't got it and I'm talking all big about this book, but I really didn't have 16 pounds to go to Waterstones and buy it. It was a, a new book. You couldn't go to a secondhand shop. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the things that we can do if we want to put ourselves, you know, clearly the industry is shit and it's got a long way to go. However, if you don't want to put yourself at a disadvantage, do, there are certain things that you can do to get ahead in publishing, which is look beneath the headlines. So let's just say, uh, we won't use Philip Pullman as an example, uh, but let's say Joanne Harris has got a new book out and you know you're going to go for an interview or, you, or, or somehow you need to demonstrate a knowledge of the industry. Joanne Harris has got a new book out. Have a look on the jo Joanne Harris website. Have a look at who's doing her PR. Have a look at her previous books. Ha know something about Joanne Harris's private life or personal life or her life as a writer. Go onto YouTube, look at interviews with her. So do as much homework you can so that you're not an, as a disadvantage in that interview. And if someone says to you, have you got the book? You say, I would absolutely love the book. And perhaps next week when I get paid, I'll buy it. You don't need to say, I haven't got 16 99 but let them fucking know you haven't got 16 99 No, of course, no. You say, yeah, in, a, in three or four weeks' time when I've got that spare money, I'll definitely buy it. So frame it in a positive way. We take on the responsibility for finding out as much as we can when we're in those spaces. That's free. There is very little you can't find out on YouTube. I remember giving a talk once to some uh, students and I said, you know, you haven't got very much money and you want to do this research. And let's say you're doing a historical novel research or some, some research that involves, means that you've got to travel to look at this country house in Dorchester or wherever. Go on to YouTube. I said, there is nothing you cannot find on YouTube. Save yourself the train fare, save yourself the day out and look on YouTube. Not always, but nine times out of 10, you can do your research from a desktop. Also, you, there's some things you have to go and be immersed in the space, be immersed in the space, the smells and just the vastness of some things or the tininess of some things you need to go and experience, but start on YouTube. And so someone said, oh, not, not everything will be on YouTube. Someone said from the audience. And I said, yes, most things are on YouTube. I said, let's think of a, let's think of something bizarre that you would never you know find out anywhere else and so i said hedgehog racing is there such a thing as hedgehog racing so somebody there and then in the in the class went on their phone went on to youtube and there is hedgehog racing now no way. Hedgehog racing. yes there is have a look that's what i'm saying the, the weirdest things in the world will be on youtube start there it's a long way around of saying if you're going for an interview or if you've got any opportunity to meet someone or to further your career start on youtube with doing some research about that subject or that person so that you don't feel as much at a disadvantage and you know what in an interview saying i looked on youtube and i saw your interview with is massively impressive don't be ashamed so i've got my my information from youtube Sonic, the little oh, alien yeah. hedgehog. Exactly. Yeah. That's all I get thinking about my head. <laughs> I mean, he's a racing hedgehog, fair enough. <laughs> um, but just, I wanted to just lead back 
to um, the quote that we pulled from the Edinburgh International Book Festival when you said that the government should be afraid of the working class. What did you mean by this? And what did you, like, what led you to developing this opinion? Well, um, I mean, God, I don't know where to start on that one. <laughs> the government should be afraid of the working class. Are the government afraid of the working class? No, they're not. They manipulate the working class. And the working class are so busy togging their forelock at their betters in inverted commas they do not exploit their power at all the working class make up the majority of this country if the working class stopped working this country would fall apart but the working class doesn't flex its power we don't use our numbers to say we don't want that let's let let's just take universal credit one of the most shit oppressive things ever why don't all of the working class people say no you can't live on that why why don't they band together for the sake of those people who genuinely need that extra 20 pounds and strike and say we're not doing any more work till they get their 20 pounds why don't we make more noise why don't we complain more why don't we and mostly it's because we're tired we're beaten down we can't afford to strike because we may not have a job job to go back to there's so many reasons but if we banded together the government would not be able to stand against us we first start we would get the Tories out and that would be my lifelong ambition yeah <laughs> um, but as a minimum complain about things that affect us so badly so the government should be very very afraid of the working classes and they're not because they're very expert at manipulating them and making them think that the upper class is no better which is the biggest pile of shit i've ever heard they should be afraid if they untap all of this power that they have what would the world look like the future besides all of that uh, we would mentioned? have universal basic income so everyone would get paid no matter what, which would allow many other people to experiment with art. Some of the best art in this and the best culture in this world has come from people having some kind of space in their lives to experiment and make mistakes. I thought I was a poet. I was a, I'm actually a painter. I thought I was a painter. I'm actually a sculptor. People who've had the space and the time and the energy and the support to experiment with art and come up with fantastic, beautiful, exciting things. And if we had universal basic income, it would give people that opportunity. It would also give people a safety net. People would have space in their head to think, oh my God, whatever happens, I can eat. So then I can relax so that I can have better mental health. So I can spend time with my children. Also to have much more social housing so that people didn't think they were second class citizens because they rent so that they could have security of tenure. They can't be tossed out because the landlord wants to make an Airbnb out of their house. The health service is, is going down the tubes, no fault of, or fault of the health service, but very much a, a government study so that they can sell it off. That would come back. Free dental care, it's very, very difficult to get dental care for a lot of people. I would probably do away completely with private schools. There would be no private schools at all. There would only be state schools. Probably quite a socialist, <laughs> a socialist uh, community. It would, it would be better. It would be better. It would be kinder. It would be more embracing. It would be safer and have more security for, for normal people. In, in this ideal world that you've just described, there's not, you're not really making any sacrifices. You're not saying to be able to buy the materials for what I'm passionate about, I'm going to eat less tonight, or I'm going to walk two hours so that I can save my bus fare so that I can still go and, and I can pay for the ticket for this exhibition. Exactly. Um, the working class are made to sacrifice a lot of their time, their energy, their money to be able to break into the industry. Both I and I have had experiences where work required for us to build our CVs has been unpaid, where we need to e even travel, we need to go far. And even that wasn't even considered in that resources, which we could not balance with our other commitments needed to make a living because in the arts, a lot of things are kind of, you have to do an internship or work experience, but they don't really consider that you you've got two jobs on the side, trying to make rent, trying to do everything, support yourselves. And um, the book actually covered this. Um, Cultures Bad Free actually found that 81% of people within the publishing sector have worked for free, which is 
a big, big majority. majority. Yeah. Do you think that this is something that the working class should sacrifice to break into the industry? To with their time and energy. Yeah. If 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 you can't change it at the moment, should we? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and the obvious answer is no. That we should, you know, completely do away with unpaid internships and uh, more support for people that w- when you say, oh, you know, come to this interview, it's in Greenwich. Where do you live? I live in Hillingdon. So, you know, two hours to get there, probably 20 quid to get there. And of course, the the answer would be people would say, "Don't, don't apply for the interview that is two hours and 20 quid away. However, there are so few opportunities. You you literally scrabble around for, for anything, particularly in TV and media. Some of those jobs are so badly paid. And so what you have, as you rightly say, is you have people making sacrifices about whether to eat. But I want to go to that interview. I, I want to go and see that exhibition. So I won't do X. And so you're doing this trade off all the time in order to get on. Now, in many ways, that struggle is Uh, across the board there are lots and lots of people that make sacrifices and weigh things up and it is part of growing up and it's part of growing however it's also oppressive and it's really hard making that decision about trading off things once in a while is really good for you really really good for you the alternative to that is you're spoiled you can do what you want when you want you've got all the money in the world So do you want that model of someone that doesn't appreciate what they've got and they can do whatever they want? No, you don't. Do you want the constant trade-off that is oppressive and hard and can make you depressed? No, you don't. You want some kind of learning experience where you're having to make some decisions about trading off things. I won't do that so I can do that because you will do that for the rest of your life. I'm still doing that, that I, I want to have that thing, but I can't do that thing if I do that thing that's part of being a grown-up and part of being um, mature is that you can make those trade-offs however when you see lots of people not having to make those trade-offs and getting on because they don't have to make those trade-offs that can be very oppressive and hurtful and unfair and it comes back to what I was saying about resilience so you know you have people say all the time oh the working class people are really resilient you know it, it, that making those trade-offs builds resilience You know, that word that is shoved at you all the time. Resilience is not always a good thing. I'm being resilient. What are you doing? You're just buying the ticket for the thing. That's not, there is a big difference between being resilient and being mature and grown up. And resilience, constantly having to find the energy to be resilient is wearing and not universally good for you. There are some times you want, of course, an opportunity to be resilient. And there are lots of times you want to have the ticket or the money or the dinner and not have to be resilient. Of course, be resilient about some things and about other things. Give me the easy road. Thank you very much. You just have to go through with it, you know, if you you don't have the time and resource. I did art A-level. I never cowered away from my, you know, cheap ways. I was always the cheap one in my art class because all my materials was from like the pound shop or, you know, it was really cheap. But one thing that I was always proud of was that I would always get the good quality, even with my cheapness. And I hated it sometimes because the teacher expected us to be here with like 20 pound sketchbooks for our, our stuff. And I'm here with my 50p book. That was really good quality. And I didn't think back then I I didn't feel, um, you know, sad or ashamed of it. I was I was happy. I was like, guys, look at my book. It's 50p. And everyone here is like saying, wow. I was like, when I went into uni, it was a bit harder. And I was like, okay, this resilience thing that I'm doing, this like whole looking for other alternative ways, maybe a bit more of an embarrassment than I realized. And it's an embarrassment. that really it's also- hindered me in uni. <clears throat> It's also energy. While you're going to seven shops looking for your 50 pence book, there's some people who are going to the first shop and buying a book for a five pound and they're getting on with their work. You're spending your hours that you should be doing your homework or your work or your painting or your thinking or your daydreaming. You're having to go and look for something. So that resilience that you're your your emotional energy and your physical time and your physical energy that you're spending on resilience Some people are spending that on the work, on the picture, on the writing, on watching the film. So resilience is not necessarily a great thing. A certain amount of it is very, very good. Resilience at your A-level, then the first year of your degree, then the second year of your degree, then the third year of degree, and you run out of resilience. And you know know what you want? You just want the fucking money to buy the five pound book so I can go and get on with my, my shit. 
get on with my career, get on with doing the work that I'm wanting to do rather than source the things that I need to do my work. So that's exactly what I mean. Resilience is, is, is great, of course. And being a parent, I want my children to be resilient. I want them to know how to overcome limitations, how to overcome problems. Do I want them to do about every single thing in their life every single day? No, I don't. I want them to have easy streets sometimes. We all deserve easy streets sometimes. It's both a blessing and a curse. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the point here, I think. Yeah, a blessing and a curse at the same time. You still have to do it because of your background and Absolutely. everything else. And you just have to smile through it, you know, just suck it up and go. Even if yeah. you don't want to do it and you miss out on so much opportunities because you don't have the time. Like you said, you had two working jobs. Yeah. You had the waitress job, all of this. Yeah. You just have to suck it up. And that does hurt you in the end. Yeah. And you get so burnt out, so physically <laughs> and mentally exhausted. Sometimes I people lose the passion that yes. they came to art with. I feel like you go home and your first thought within the writing industry, let's say, your first thought is not, oh my God, there's this book that I'm, I, I've loved reading, or there's this chapter that I haven't finished writing, or this article. That's not your first thought. Your first thought is, oh my God, let me shower and go to bed. You yeah. don't have the time to be yeah. creative. You just, you're burnt out. There's yeah. nothing left. Absolutely. And so, I mean, it's one of the reasons Art Emergency is so good. And it's one of the reasons that we need to support one another if we're having that shift. So, you know, finding someone else that's got your background or understands your background so that you can sound off about these things or so that you can say, look, you buy the 50 pence book this week or you buy the five pound book and we can share our resources. Just articulating the shit is important. So just having a forum an opportunity to say to your friends or to somebody, I'm really tired. I really want to write that thing, but I've got three jobs. Being able to say that, being able to articulate the difficulties that we have is really part of the solution. Anything where you can say, I understand, I, I can help, I can sympathise. Shame is one of the worst things, the worst emotions, the worst things to feel. Shame about who you are, shame about where you come from, shame about what you haven't got shame of what you're having to do to make ends meet it's really destructive to the soul and the psyche anything that we can do for another person that makes them feel less ashamed and more proud of who they are and just show a little bit of understanding of the position they're in i've been in it i'm not in it now but i've been in it where i've had no money and i've had no food and i've had no clothes and i've had no warmth and i would never ever ever want anyone to feel like that but you want to have the friends around you and the people around you that when you say, I am 20 pence short of my bus fare, they can sympathise, help you out or walk with you if you have to walk. And so surround yourselves with those people. It's really, really important for your mental health. Coming back to like the shame aspect, when when they ask you to read aloud in class, oh my God, that not was- not being able to pronounce the word. Exactly. And then you're stalling and you're, you're looking around, you're looking up, you're unsure and no one's saying anything. <laughs> And you're sat there and it's it's such a such a an embarrassing moment when you should really be celebrating the fact that wow, you've got you the vocabulary be. of two yeah. languages. Celebrate them guys. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite book? <laughs> I've been dying. My to favorite book is that. genuinely, genuinely impossible. <laughs> um, because I have so many. Mm. I would probably say... Um, Which book would you recommend then? <laughs> okay, a, re a really, really good book is a book called The Thing About December. It's a, it's a book about a young man who's got learning difficulties who lives in Ireland. I think it's probably eight years, maybe eight or nine years old. It's written by somebody called Donal Ryan. And it's a really simple story. It's so well written. Uh, it's written with a lot of empathy. And if I could recommend it, get it on audiobook, if you're going to get it at all, because it's read by the author. That's not always a good thing, but on this occasion, it's a very good thing. It's just beautiful. On my end, first of all, going into reading and writing would be the Throne of Glass series. I had that book since year 70, year 10, so for three years, I have not touched that book. I haven't read it. And then randomly in English class, I started reading it because you have to read 10 minutes. Yeah. And I couldn't put the book down. Oh, and the Red Queen series. I love that book. I haven't read that, actually. I've heard very good things about it. Um... The plot twist in book one is plot twisty. <laughs> 
So again, just thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And we really hope that these ideas can be used proactively by the industry and the working class. And the mantra of I have no something that others don't is gonna be in my head whenever I feel yeah. like I'm at a disadvantage. Good. I'm yeah. really glad. Bye. 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 This podcast was created by Arts Emergencies Youth Collective with support from the University of Edinburgh. Thanks goes to Dave O'Brien, Orion Brook and of course Kit Deval. See you next time.